Good morning, ladies. I just love worship. Thank you so much, Anna. I love worship. And ladies, we're going to be worshiping for eternity. So we're getting practice here. So we're in Esther chapter 3 this, this week. It's a kind of a short chapter, so I'm going to go ahead and read through it, and then we'll break it down by verse. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants were, who were within the, gate, the king's gates bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gates said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Hazarus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all the other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is fitting that the king not, for the king not to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took the signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all the people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus it was written, and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all the people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel, so the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. So let's pray before we get into it. Lord, I pray right now, God, that um, you would speak to each one of us, Father, where you know we need to hear from you. Each one of us needs to hear your voice, and we, pray, we just pray, Lord, that you would touch us where you know we need a touch, Father. We just pray and thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So verse 1 says, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. Again, we see this phrase, after these things. So let's quickly look back at what we've learned in the last two chapters and see what these things are. In chapter one, Queen Vashti was dethroned by King Ahasuerus after she refused to parade herself in front of the men at the king's drunken party. The king was furious and asked his closest advisors what he should do. 
After receiving bad advice from them, he removed Vashti as queen. After a series of events that we studied about in chapter two, Esther became the new queen. Her cousin Mordecai uncovers a plot to kill the king and the conspirators are hanged. Now in chapter three, we're introduced to a man named Haman. Haman is an Agagite. He's a descendant of Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. The history of the Amalekites goes back to Exodus 17, eight to 16, when Israel fought against them and won. Exodus 17, 13 and 14 says, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So now let's fast forward and go to 1 Samuel when God told Saul to destroy Amalek. In 1 Samuel 15, 3, God tells Saul, now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them, but kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. There's a reason for everything that God says to do. One commentator said, if Saul didn't destroy all of the Amalekites, one of their descendants would one day rise up and seek to destroy all of the Jews. But Saul didn't obey God. In 1 Samuel 15, 7, 7 to 9, it says, and Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And they were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So Saul destroyed all of the people except for Agag. He destroyed everything that he didn't want, but what he wanted and what he considered to be the best. This is blatant disobedience to God. Saul goes even further when he not only lies, but he blames the people. 1 Samuel 15, 18 to 22, the prophet Samuel confronts Saul, saying, Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, king of the Am Am Amalek. Well, that's not what he was told to do, is it? I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took the plunder, sheep, and oxen, the best of the things which should have utterly been destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of the rams. Ladies, God wants our full obedience to him. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you and telling you to do something or to not do something, be obedient and sensitive to his voice. Saul made a decision that was against what God instructed him to do, and Saul was removed as king because of his disobedience to the Lord. But this decision not only affected him, it ultimately affected many more. Chuck Smith wrote, Saul's disobedience, allowing flesh to still remain, is now coming back to haunt his descendants years later there are consequences to disobedience. The king elevates Haman to chief officer of the entire empire. It was a very high position. Matthew Henry in his commentary wrote, I wonder what the king saw in Haman that was commendable. 
It is plain that he was not a man of honor or justice or of any true courage or steady conduct, but proud and passionate and revengeful. And we'll see more of those characteristics in Haman as we go on. Verse 2. And the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for the king had commanded concerning him that Mordecai would not bow and pay homage. So the king commands all the servants that are inside his gate to bow down and pay homage or respect to Haman, but Mordecai refused. We're not sure why Mordecai refused, possibly because he was a Jew and he refused to bow to anyone except God, or maybe he just didn't respect Haman and wasn't going to bow to him. But he took a stand and he wasn't about to give in. Mordecai is a Jew and Haman an Amalekite, the enemy of the Jews. The Lord declared war on the Amalekites for what they had done to the people of Israel. Exodus 17, 16 says, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war on Amalek from generation to generation. Verses three and four. Then the king's servants who were within the gates said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he did not listen to them, they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So the king's servants noticed that Mordecai wasn't bowing down to Haman and they confronted him. They asked him why he wasn't obeying the king's command. These servants of the king would ask Mordecai daily. They didn't give up. Mordecai finally told them that he is a Jew. One commentator suggested that possibly they were testing Mordecai to see if he would give in, but he didn't. So they went and they told Haman. Verses five and six. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of, of Hazarus, the people of Mordecai. When Haman heard that Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, he was furious. I suspect that finding out that Mordecai was a Jew just added fuel to his anger. Warren Wearsby wrote, from that time on, Haman watched Mordecai and nursed his anger, not only towards the man at the gate, but also toward all the Jews in the empire. Haman was so furious, he decided it wasn't enough just to get Mordecai, but he wanted to destroy all the Jews throughout the whole kingdom. Power and pride have filled Haman. And God has a lot to say about pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And 1 John 2, 16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Power and pride have filled Haman, but now he wanted revenge. If Haman couldn't have Mordecai's honor and respect, now he wanted not only his life, but all the lives of the people of Mordecai. Haman could have reported Mordecai to the king for not obeying his command, which probably would have caused the execution of Mordecai, but he was not gonna be satisfied with just Mordecai's death. He wanted his revenge spread to the entire Jewish people. Verse seven. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the 12th, on the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Now Haman is about to put his evil plan into action. The date selected was the month of Adar. This would have been the month of March. And some say specifically it was March 7th. The month of Nisan was April. So this plan would not even take place for nearly a year later. 
Court astrologers were called in to cast lots to determine the date. This was like dice. They would roll the dice to determine the date. This was a common practice they had in those days to make important decisions. But we know that nothing happens by chance. Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. God's hand was on all of this. Nothing happens to us in our life that God doesn't know about or hasn't already ordained. Job 12, 9 to 10 says, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Ladies, we don't need to cast lots or roll dice to guide our decisions. We have the Holy Spirit, God's word, and prayer. Now there's a date, almost a year later, this gives the Jews about 11 months to prepare and to think about what was to come. Warren Wearsby wrote, it's interesting that Haman began this procedure in the month of Nisan, the very month the Jews celebrated their deliverance from Egypt. Again, nothing happens by chance. Now we have a date, so let's see what Haman does next. Verses eight and nine. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from other people's and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is, not, is it not fitting for the king to let them remain? If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it to the king's treasuries. So now Haman starts off with false accusations. He goes to the king and tells him there's a certain people or race of people throughout the kingdom that have different laws from all the other people and they don't obey the king's laws. First of all, he doesn't even name who this group of people is that he's accusing. Second, there is no evidence that they're not obeying the king's laws. If this group of people had been disobeying the king's laws, the king most likely would have heard about it by now. Even if some Jews were not following the laws, why should the entire nation of Israel be destroyed? It is true that the Jewish people's laws were different. They were God's people, they were given and kept God's laws, but that didn't mean they didn't obey the laws of the king or the laws of the land that they lived in. Now Haman suggests that if it pleases the king to have a decree written that these people be destroyed. Haman even goes as far as offering 10,000 talents of silver to anyone that would do the work and it would be brought into the king's treasury. This seems to be kind of a bribe to get the king to agree. The annual income of the entire Persian Empire at that time was about 15,000 talents, so 10,000 talents was a great deal of money. David Gusick said, this money would not come from Haman's own pocket. It would be obtained from the property of the slaughtered Jews. So Haman didn't have anything to lose by offering that money. Verses 10 to 11. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hapidatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the, king, and the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as it seems good to you. So Haman convinces the king that the best thing to do in his best interest was to annihilate these people without even asking any questions or even knowing who these people were, once again, once again King Ahasuerus acts hastily on bad advice. He hands the signet ring over to Haman. Proverbs 18.13 says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Back then a signet ring was very important. It was an official or royal seal that was used like a signature to legalize a document. So Haman got what he wanted, 
the king to agree with him that the Jews must be eliminated, and he got the king's signet ring without the, the king even taking time to find out if any of these claims were true. Not only is Haman getting the power and the authority, now he's also getting the money. The king tells Haman the people and the money were his to do with whatever he wanted. Haman seems to be on top of the world at this point. So let's read verse 12. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all Haman commanded to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all the people, to every province according to his script and every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. So as the Jews are preparing for Passover, Haman's at work writing this new law and having it translated into the languages of all the people within the empire. Once the law was written and sealed with the signet ring, it was a done deal. The destruction of the Jews was sealed. The laws of the Medes and the Persians could not be changed once they were written and sealed with the king's ring. We saw that in Esther 1, 19a, where it says, if it please the king, let the royal decree go out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered. Also in Daniel 6, 8, now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So once again, it seems like the Jews' fate is sealed with this ring. Once a decree or a law is stamped with the signet ring, it's done. It can't be changed. The fate of the Jewish peoples seems to be really sealed at this point with that ring. This seemed like an impossible situation, but we know with God, nothing is impossible. Matthew 19, 26 says, but Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Verse 13. Oops, sorry, I lost my place here for a second. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the pro king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. So the letters are sent out to all the provinces, to all the people throughout the empire in their own language. And in the name of the king, it was sealed with his signet ring. The words of this law sound very similar to the instructions given to Saul in 1 Samuel 15 that we read earlier, where God told Samuel to completely destroy the Amalekites. <clears throat> the only difference is Saul was told not to take of the spoil, but this decree says the opposite. It says to take the plunder. The property of the Jews would be given to anyone who killed them. There was now a new incentive money and wealth. Greed was as commonplace back then as it is today in our society. But Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in Luke 11:39, saying, now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Verses 14 to 15. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province being published for all people that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. So now the decree is written, it's sealed and ready to be sent out to all the people in all the provinces in their own languages. The courier hurried out to deliver this decree of destruction. The king and Haman sat down to drink as this decree was being delivered. David Gusick wrote, when the king sat down to drink, he thought he had done well, but he didn't really understand what he had done. 
Haman also sat down to drink, and he thought that he had done well, and he knew exactly what he intended to do. The people throughout the empire are confused. The Jews have been living among, among these people possibly all of their lives. They knew the Jewish people as a whole weren't troublemakers or lawbreakers, so they were confused when this decree came out saying that the Jews were dangerous enemies. While the people of his kingdom were confused and probably a little afraid of what was to come, the king is drinking and celebrating with a wicked man at his palace in Shushan the Citadel where this decree was declared, probably unaware or uncaring of what he had done. Although these things, these things all seemed hopeless, confusing, and bleak, God had a plan, and God had two people prepared and in place, Mordecai and Esther. In our darkest, hardest moments, God is working. He has a plan in place for us and for our life. We can't always see what he's doing until we're on the other side of the trial, and maybe not even then. Psalm 121.4 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So ladies, what's troubling you today? What difficult situation or trial are you facing that seems hopeless or impossible? Let's keep our eyes focused on the Lord, the one that neither slumbers nor sleeps. Romans 5, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access to faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. He is our hope, he is our peace, our joy, and our comfort. So let's rest in that as we continue to walk with him in obedience and in love. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word, Father. And Father, I pray that um, we can just apply it to our own lives, Lord. Whatever we're going through, whatever may seem impossible to us at the moment, we know that all things are possible with you. So we give it all to you, Father the one that never slumbers nor sleeps, Lord. And as we go into our groups, Father, I just pray right now that you would bless the group time, that you would just be glorified and be pleased with, with the conversation. I just thank you again for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.